Hi, I'm Emily Gross from the University of South Wales and in this presentation today I'm going to discuss a research paper that was published in the Journal of Applied Behaviour Analysis in 2017 in which myself and Dr Jennifer Austin evaluated the effects of interdependent and independent group contingencies during the Good Behaviour Game. Group contingencies are often used in classrooms to target the behaviour of a group of students. They are particularly useful if you have many students within a classroom who engage in problematic behaviour as you can target the whole class with one intervention. One type of uh, group contingency is an interdependent group contingency in which the uh, same contingency of reinforcement is in effect for all members and reinforcement delivery is determined by the overall performance of the group. Another type of group contingency is an independent group contingency, whereby the contingency is presented to all members, but reinforcement is only delivered to those members who meet the particular criterion. So in, in an interdependent group contingency, students are essentially working as a team, and in the independent group contingency, students are uh, working as individuals for themselves. Both of these types of group contingencies have been used in the classrooms and other school settings effectively and um, there's been a fair number of studies that have compared the use of both of these, both interdependent and independent. As some practitioners may wonder which is the most effective, which should they use? However, the results of these comparisons have been mixed. So some researchers have found that interdependent group contingencies are more effective, whereas others have found independent contingencies to be superior. And then some researchers have found uh, no difference between the two. In preparation for the study that I'm going to discuss today, we uh, reviewed this literature that compares interdependent and independent contingencies, and we found that there were at least three notable features of that literature. So firstly, there is a high prevalence of group contingencies employing punishment-based strategies. So these contingencies typically involve a timeout or response cost procedure. There were uh, far less research studies that have used group contingencies that employ reinforcement-based strategies in that, in that group of literature that we, re that we reviewed. Given uh, our current ethical mandate to employ reinforcement based procedures as a first course of action, more research comparing group contingencies that employ reinforcement based procedures would be, uh, would be, would be useful. Secondly, most of the studies that we reviewed uh, for reported data on the behaviour of a group of students rather than individual student behaviour. Although this approach is appealing when uh, you're running a study focused on classroom management, looking at how a, a system affects individual uh, students' behaviour would provide a more sensitive estimate of a treatment's efficacy. Additionally, uh, individual data may be particularly important when only a small number of students within a class engage in problematic behaviour. And then thirdly, the majority of the studies that we reviewed employed multi-treatment reversal designs to dem demonstrate experimental control and we found that these didn't counterbalance across classrooms, so there's a risk of sequence effects. Although there are some limitations to the group contingency literature, group contingencies are commonly used in classrooms and there is a lot of evidence to support its their use in doing so. The Good Behaviour Game is a classroom management intervention that employs an interdependent group contingency and it has a wealth of empirical evidence to support its use. It's previously been used to increase appropriate classroom behaviours such as active participation in class and assignment completion and it's also been used to decrease inappropriate behaviours such as verbal or physical disruption. Despite the overwhelming evidence to support the use of the, of the GBG, some teachers may have concerns about the interdependent group contingency component of the intervention, particularly if they have low confidence in their students' abilities to work in teams. Dr Austin and I were conducting a teacher training on the Good Behaviour Game and some of the feedback that we were receiving from teachers was that they didn't believe their students could work in teams, that they didn't have the social skills ne necessary to work in teams. Some teachers may also perceive the interdependent group contingency to be unfair to students. 
As teachers' perceptions of treatment acceptability may have important impl implications for the adoption and the integrity of classroom systems, it's important to investigate a way in which the good behaviour game can be adapted to meet teacher preferences. The purpose of the current study was to compare interdependent and independent group contingencies within the context of the Good Behaviour Game. And we also sought to address limitations in the current literature, examine student preferences for type of group contingency via a group preference condition, and to assess teacher perceptions of the Good Behaviour Game. And this was to be carried out in a classroom with, with students whose teachers had raised concerns about their students' abilities to work in teams. The participants in our study were four children aged between 9 and 10 years old who attended a purple referral unit. A PRU is a school for children who've been excluded from the mainstream schools due to their challenging behaviour. Although there were seven children in the class in total, Rhys, Thomas, David and Owen were identified by their teacher as being the most destructive children in the class, so therefore we only collected data on those four children. Data was collected during work activities in which the students were expected to work independently. We collected data on three target behaviours, so these were verbal disruption, inappropriate sitting and off-task behaviour, and these operational definitions were developed based on research and observation in the classroom and through discussion with the teacher. Partial interval recording was used to collect data on our three target behaviours and our observation length varied between 9 and 12 minutes, so about 3 minutes per child. Inter-observer agreement data was recorded during 36% of sessions and our mean IOA was 93%. In order to measure treatment integrity, a 10-item checklist was developed that included a list of all the steps that were required to play the game. These steps included um, items such as did the teacher announce when the game was beginning, um, did the teacher award points on an appropriate schedule. As I describe our experimental conditions, I will refer to the interdependent group contingency condition as the team game and I'll refer to the independent group contingency condition as the individual game and that's how we uh, refer to the conditions uh, with the teacher. So during baseline, we just asked the teacher to respond to disruptive behaviours in her classroom as she usually would. Following baseline then, we trained the teacher uh, on both versions of the game, the team and the individual game, and this training lasted two hours and it included a description of the procedures, a detailed step-by-step -step handout, uh, modelling of the procedures and an opportunity for role play. We also showed some uh, video recordings of uh, us implementing the game previously and um, we ended with a discussion around the rules of the game and what the game would look like in her classroom. During the individual good behaviour game, we had three rules displayed on a poster in the classroom. These rules were request attention appropriately, show successful sitting and stay on task. And these rules were aligned to our target behaviours. A scoreboard was displayed at the front of the class that included the names of all children in the class. And at the start of each game, the children were reminded of the rules. During the game, we gave the teacher a motivator, which would uh, vibrate every two minutes and uh, she would shout freeze as it, vibrate, as it vibrated and then she would deliver a point to every student who had been following the rules of the game for the previous two minute interval. At the end of the session, the teacher would add up each child's points and write the total next to his or her name. The teacher re then revealed the mystery number and any child who received on or above that number were awarded with a mystery prize. So the children were unaware what the criterion was for winning um, until the end of the game and they were unaware of what prize they were working for until the end of the game. Prizes included a game of Uno, uh, a piece of fruit, five minutes free time, um, a drawing on, or a drawing on the whiteboard for five minutes. So these are just some uh, of the pictures of our poster that the teacher created. Uh, that displayed our rules and we had some visual aids to go along with that and then we had the envelopes with our mystery prize and our um, mystery number. During the team game, so this is the interdependent group contingency, all of the procedures as I just described for the individual game were the same, however uh, we introduced this interdependent group contingency so what that looked like was we divided the class into two teams.
When the timer went off, uh, the, the teacher would then deliver a point to each team if all children within that team had been following the rules of the game. When we were deciding on who was in each team, we asked the teacher to just ensure that there was at least one child within each team who could model appropriate behaviour. We then uh, ended on a group preference condition. So uh, what this looked like was at the start of every session, we would ask the students to write down which version of the game they would like to play, the individual game or the team game. And then the teacher collected their votes and selected, uh, selected one at random. Whichever game was selected at random would be the game that, the version of the game that would be played that session. Research design was an alternating treatments design, so we had our initial baseline followed by a phase of alternating treatments with an interspersed baseline, and then we ended with our group preference condition. This graph displays the results for Reese, one of our target children. So I'll just explain the graph first. So along the x-axis we have the session number, and along the y-axis we have the percentage of intervals each behaviour occurred. The top tier displays the results for verbal disruption, the middle tier inappropriate sitting, and the bottom tier off-task behaviour. So as you can see from our uh, initial baseline, Reese engaged in uh, moderate levels of all three behaviours with loss of variability uh, with inappropriate sitting. We then introduced our alternating treatments. So here the closed triangles represent the team good behaviour game and the open circles represent the individual good behaviour game. Closed squares are our interspersed baseline. If there are any missing data points along the data path, then these indicate that Reese was missing for that session. He was absent from school. So as you can see, both versions of the game were effective at reducing Reese's disruptive behaviour. We observed immediate decreases in verbal disruption, inappropriate sitting and off-task behaviour. However, we didn't see any differences in effectiveness between the two versions of the game, so they were both very effective. We had lots of overlap uh, in those two data paths. During the group preference condition that we ended on, uh, the team game was chosen three times and the individual game was chosen twice. Reese engaged in zero levels of behaviour during all sessions in this group preference condition for a team and individual good behaviour game with the exception of one session. The next graph displays the results for David. During baseline, David engaged in low to moderate levels of verbal disruption and moderate to high levels of inappropriate sitting and off-task behaviour. Upon introduction of our alternating treatments phase, we observed decreases in all behaviours in both versions of the good behaviour game, with zero or near zero levels of inappropriate sitting and off-task behaviour. This effect then continued uh, into our group preference condition. The next graph displays the results for Thomas and Owen. Although we collected data on every dependent variable for each child, we've only displayed the results for those behaviours that are most problematic for that child. Thomas and Owen engaged in moderate levels of verbal disruption and off-task respectively during baseline. If we look at Thomas's alternating treatments phase first, we can see that during both the team and the individual good behaviour game sessions, his behaviour reduced to near zero levels. A reduction in variability was also observed during the team and the individual good behaviour game relative to baseline. In dispersed baseline sessions, in results indicate that uh, behaviour increased to similar levels observed during the initial baseline. So when we uh, had those sessions where we removed the game, uh, the behaviour did increase back up to uh, pre-intervention levels. For Owen, off-task behaviour reduced in the team game. However, the individual game produced slightly further reductions. However, during the interspersed baseline sessions, these results indicate that when the game wasn't played, uh, levels of off-task behaviour were still higher than when either the, the team or the individual game was played. During the group preference condition, Thomas engaged in zero levels of verbal disruption in both the team and the individual game. Owen missed two of the five group preference conditions. However, however when he was present, off-task behaviour remained low uh, in both versions of the game. The purpose of the current study was to adapt the good behaviour game to meet teacher preferences and our results suggest that we can do this while still maintaining the effectiveness of the game. 
We observe decreases in verbal disruption, inappropriate sitting and off-task behaviour in all participants during both the individual good behaviour game and the team good behaviour game. Not only are our procedures a departure from a typical group contingency arrangements in classrooms, they're also a departure from original good behaviour game procedures as described by Barry Jones and Wolf in 1969. Although current research suggests that reinforcement based strategies during the good behaviour game are no more effective than punishment based strategies during the good behaviour game, the reinforcement based procedures are more aligned with current ethical mandates and may therefore be deemed more acceptable by consumers. During the group preference condition, the majority of students told us that they preferred playing the team game. We found this particularly interesting given that these children have histories of uh, difficulties in getting along with their classmates. The children also told us that they enjoyed being part of a team and uh, getting more help from their peers. Although this is highly speculative, it is possible that these students who have been um, rejected by their mainstream peers because of their problem behaviour may have enjoyed the opportunity to uh, work together in a team towards a common goal. Given the anecdotal evidence of um, increased social and team working skills during the good behaviour game, research is needed to uh, explicitly measure these variables. Since we published this study, we have actually uh, conducted research where we measured uh, positive interactions and uh, negative peer interactions during the good behaviour game. And what we found was that when the game was being played, positive peer interactions increased and negative interactions between peers decreased. This, uh, this study has uh, since been accepted for publication in Java and should be available to view later this year. At the end of the study, we conducted social validity assessments with the teacher and she noted that the children in her class enjoyed playing the good behaviour game. She found it easy to implement and she said she would continue to play the game in the future. Again, these are all really important considerations for teachers and things that they, can, they think about when they are choosing behaviour management strategies for their classrooms. As we conducted the study in a small classroom of just seven children in a pupil referral unit, replication should be conducted in larger classrooms and maybe uh, mainstream classrooms and potentially with larger teams as many small teams may become unmanageable for teachers. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation today and if you have any questions about uh, this study then feel free to send me an email and I would be happy to chat to you about it further.